ഓം നമോ ഭഗവതെ വാസുദേവായ ഓം നമോ ഭഗവതെ വാസുദേവായ ഓം നമോ ഭഗവതെ വാസുദേവായ നാരായണം നമസ്കൃത്യ നരം ചൈവ നരോത്തമം ദേവീം സരസ്വതീം വ്യാസം തോ ജയം മുദീരയേ നഷ്ടപ്രായേഷ്വഭദ്രേഷു നിത്യം ഭാഗവത സേവയ ഭഗവതേയുത്തമ ശ്ലോകെ ഭക്തിർഭവതി നൈഷ്ടികീ മന്ത്രാശ്രീമദ്ഭാഗവതം കീ So thank you Arjun Prabhu for uh, taking this initiative and starting a Krishna Katha at night. We are now used to Krishna Katha in the mornings and we hope and pray that uh, once everything is back to uh, temple programs, it's still recorded and uh, put on Facebook for everybody's benefit. Yeah. People are used to it. And on top of that, it's nice that we now have Krishna Katha at night as well uh, being lined up. so that we have twice a day krishna katha flooding us and purifying our existence so uh, to start this i was wondering what is a good past time or story for narration and uh, i was thinking about it when just crossed my mind that why don't we start from one of my personal favorite characters or personalities in shrimad bhagavatam and uh, that is the personality of uh, prithrasur from canto 6 from chapter 7 to 12 the story is narrated by sukadev goswami and uh, yes the story itself is the narration is quite comprehensive so for uh, ease of uh, uh, you know putting it in a time frame we might do it in a sequential series form krishna willing so this vritrasur episode as i said is mentioned in canto 6 uh, extremely instructive and even if we just take it as a story form it is absolutely far out i mean we couldn't imagine certain situations certain reversals that happen throughout the entire narration and it's no different from uh, an absolutely engaging a uh, thriller movie so this whole instance starts with the king of the devatas lord indra so as bhagavatam tells us indra was uh, sitting in his palace in his on his throne with his wife sachi and enjoying the beautiful dance of the apsaras the gandharvas and enjoying all the heavenly opulence something that everybody aspires for uh, when they don't have the knowledge of uh, the supreme absolute truth so he was in complete opulence and at that point of time when he was enjoying the spiritual master of the devatas brihaspati happened to just enter the assembly but indra was so intoxicated and uh, attached to all these opulences that he did not really pay much attention to his spiritual master coming in and he kind of neglected uh, his his presence when he knew that as soon as any personality forget spiritual master but even uh, a respectable personality comes in in fact any guest comes in they should be at least at as a minimum offered a place to sit uh, welcome with kind words and especially being the king that was his added responsibility to ensure nobody is neglected in his kingdom and uh, so when brihaspati came he actually neglected him and brihaspati when he saw that indra wasn't really acknowledging his presence he knew that he indra is completely engrossed in this sense gratificatory um, you know process and he thought well you know he could have cursed indra he could have done many things but he chose not to and he just quietly went away from this palace and as soon as he left from the palace indra obviously he realized that oh my spiritual master did come in and it's obviously an offense that i did not acknowledge his presence at all so he felt quite morose at, you know when that happened and he was repentant that you know i should have done this you know it's, it's so bad of me and so he sent his uh, assistants to 
look out for Brihaspati so that he can beg forgiveness and give him the welcome that he deserved. But when they, the assistants, they went to look out for him, they couldn't find Brihaspati. Just to teach Indra a lesson, Brihaspati made himself invisible. So nobody could trace his whereabouts. He, he just couldn't be found. So it is a very nice uh, instance for us to understand that Everybody, especially guests, need to be welcomed. And it is our duty to welcome them in an appropriate way. And when we are puffed up with a lot of material opulence, that's where, because of ego and pride, we tend to create offenses. And as soon as offenses come in, it's a problem. Uh, luckily, Indra, he... Uh, he kind of got back, he realized that at the nick of time, but the thing was done. On the other hand, you see the magnanimity of uh, Brihaspati. He could have easily cursed like some of the other Munis, you know, like imagine if he was Durvasa. Oh. Uh, but he chose to uh, go the way where he actually wanted Indra to learn from his mistake, a, a perfect spiritual master. Anyway, so when they couldn't find Brihaspati, they couldn't trace him at all. So Indra couldn't uh, atone for his uh, for the mistake that he had committed. And as a result of offending none other than his own spiritual master, he lost all opulence. He, he was very extremely morose. And it is said that when famous, famous important Brahminical devotees are uh, offended, the person who offends loses all their good fortune and opulence. So when Indra couldn't even atone for his uh, act, he lost all opulence. And as we can imagine, when something like this happens, news spreads far and wide. You know, even in this material world, when something happens in a country which is of significance, especially something that a prime minister or president has done uh, that he should not have done, <laughs> Um, you know, like things like corruption charges or whatever, news just travels. Within a few seconds, the entire world knows. And now with all this electronic media, it just happens instantly. So when Indra lost his bodily luster and he was morose, the demons, they came to know of it. They exactly knew what had happened. And they thought that this is a perfect opportunity for us to attack Indra and... Uh, and basically take over the uh, heavenly planets. So what they decided is they took their guidance or they took advice from their guru, who is uh, Shukracharya. He took their guidance and Shukracharya yes, said, yes, this is an opportune moment because the devatas, in lieu of offending uh, of their spiritual master, are in a very awkward position and they are very likely to suffer defeat at your hands. So getting clear instru instructions from Shukracharya, they went and attacked Indra. And as expected, they could, the Indra and the Devdas could not uh, bear the onslaught of this attack and they had to flee. And the, de and the demons, they got an ex a well-deserved victory. So it is said that uh, anybody who is having faith in their spiritual master, in brahmanas, in cows, and in the Supreme Lord, when they have complete faith and determination, then all God's good fortune accompanies them. And that's an instruction that Shukracharya had, had mentioned. Anyway, so the devatas, they lost their kingdom, they lost their opulence, and they were completely homeless. And at this point of time, they approached Lord Brahma. So Lord Brahma, he heard the Devata's story, what has happened, and he, and he told them, yes, well, you have offended your spiritual master, so you had to suffer. And so they begged forgiveness and they wanted some solution so that they can win back their kingdom. So Brahma instructed them that, see, you should approach a very powerful land, a pure Brahmana. And on his purity and his potency, you can perhaps request him to do a sacrifice and he can give you the means 
of winning back your kingdom. And he suggested that one such Brahmana is there and his name is Vishwarup. He's a son of uh, another Brahman called Toshta. So you approach him and he, he will surely fulfill your request. So all the Devdas, they got together and they approached Vishwarup. And they approached him. He was quite young, generally, you know, in, in age-wise. So he basically, the Devdas went to him and uh, begged that fact that they are, uh, they are almost like his parents. So they need to, full, as a son, they need to fulfill the request of the parents. So Vishwarup was very pleased with uh, the way the Devatas approached him. And uh, they said, well, actually, if I become your priest, the injunction is that if I become your priest and do something for you, then I, that, that benediction that you get is manifested as a result of the loss of the Brahminical powers I have acquired due to all my austerities and penance. But since you are the directors of the entire universe and are in responsible positions of authority, I can't refuse you. So I will do that for you. So Vishwarup, he took this act, this, this uh, um, proposal of acting for the Devatas and then he performed a wonderful sacrifice, extremely diligently with full attention. And he delivered the Narayan mantra or Narayan Kavach. It's a mantra in the form of a Kavach or an armor, the Narayan Kavach mantra. And this mantra is an extremely powerful mantra, having the name of Narayan, of course. And it had the potency to defeat anybody who, uh, I mean, this mantra could defeat any enemy that the Devatas would come across. Now, Vishwaru, he was obviously doing the sacrifice and he had three heads. And it's very interesting. We, we used to, you know, two, one head, two heads, four heads, maybe 10 heads, but you know, three heads. <laughs> so he had three heads and it's interestingly, Bhagavatam tells us that he used three heads for consuming three different things into his body. So one of the head was used to uh, consume somras. The other head was used to consume wine. And the third head was used to consume food. No. So with all his three heads, he was doing his, he has done, he had done his sacrifice. Now, what actually happened is Vishwarup somehow was related to the devatas and the demons. So from his father's side, Vashta's side, he was related to the devatas. But from his mother's side, he was related to the demons as well. So he was kind of equipoised towards both the opposing armies. Of course, he was kind of designated devatas to do the sacrifice for their benefit. So what he did is he did he offered his oblations and as part of the sacrifice to give Narayan Kavach to the Dev. So he was making his oblations. But when he was making his oblations on behalf of the Devatas, he secretly offered some oblations on behalf of the demons as well. And somehow the or the other, Indra got to know that this person has secretly offered oblations for the demons whom he is planning to defeat. And he was extremely fearful that what if now they become powerful and I'm not able to defeat them. And that's the whole purpose of doing the sacrifice. As soon as he, he realized that oblations have been made extremely angry, extremely fearful. And in that anger, you know, we say when, when we get angry, uh, Guru Maharaj says, when somebody is angry, the first thing you should do is zip your mouth. Very difficult to do sometimes. But the first thing is you should zip your mouth. And don't contemplate on doing anything until the anger, anger subsides. So Indra obviously was angry and in the heat of his anger, he actually cut off all the three heads of Vishwarup and killed him. That's another story that the three heads of Vishwarup took the shape, took the form of three different birds and, and went away. 
but obviously Vishwarup was killed. And he was a Brahmana. So Indra now had to suffer the reaction of killing a Brahmana, Brahmahatya. It's a very, very big offense, very, very big sin, extremely sinful activity. As a result of that, uh, that sin, I mean, Indra could have counteracted perhaps with his potency, but he chose to accept the reactions and he had to suffer the reactions for one year. And then to purify himself, he thought, why don't I distribute my, uh, the reactions that I'm getting, my, the sinful reactions that are being placed upon me, why don't I distribute to other, uh, other personalities that, who are ready to take that, and in return, I can give them some benediction. So they take away my sinful reaction or a part of my reaction, and I give them some benedictions in return. So he convinced four personalities or four people to take a part of his sinful reaction. So the first, first part of his sinful reactions was given to Earth, Mother Earth. So because Mother Earth took Indra's sinful reactions, some part of Mother Earth became deserts completely desert. So there's nothing that can grow there at all. And that's because of Indra's sinful reactions. And in the desert, no auspicious activities can take place. You know. So that was the reaction. But because they took the reaction, Indra also gave them some benediction. And what was the benediction? Benediction is that whenever there are any ditches or portholes on the surface of the earth, they will automatically get filled over time. That's a benediction. So that was the first personality. Second personality was the trees. So the reaction they, have, they had to suffer was that the sap of the tree, you know, when we break the, the branch or a, or a leaf or a twig, there's some sap that comes out. So that sap is considered contaminated, very uh, inauspicious. So they, it is because of the reaction of, of Indra's sinful activities. And the benediction they were given is when branches or twigs are broken, they will grow up, they will grow even more. So that was a benediction that they had got. The third personality was water. So water had to take the reaction and as a result, any foam and bubbles on the water again is considered inauspicious, contaminated. It's not good. The benediction they got was that whatever water mixes with, the volume will increase. It will, it will become more, it will grow. And the fourth one was, the personality was women. So as a result of taking the reactions, they had to go through the period every month. And the benediction they got was, even on those days, they are able to enjoy. If they, if they wish to, and they can enjoy continuously. So these four personalities took the reactions of, sinful reactions of Indra. So it was, what are the four? The first one is the earth, second are the trees, third is water, and fourth are women. So all these things that we see around us with these four personalities are because of Indra. So when this happened, uh, I mean, Vishwarup was killed by Indra. News obviously reached his father, Pashta, the Brahmana. And he was extremely enraged, very, very angry. So he decided to perform a big sacrifice purely with the intent of killing Indra. So he performed the sac sacrifice and while offering oblations into the fire, he wanted to say that he would like to have a son who would be an enemy of Indra. Oh, enemy of Indra, Indra Shatru. So what happened is when he was wording the oblation, instead of he, he mispronounced, so instead of saying, oh, enemy of Indra, it was Indra whose enemy is. So Indra, Indra whose enemy is, or, or, who, is an, or who is an enemy of Indra. 
Now, because of that, it was not killer of Indra, but an enemy of Indra who appeared. So from the southern side of the sacrificial fire emerged a, a very fearful personality. It is said that he, as soon as he appeared, he started growing in his form, huge, you know, went up right up to the sky. His, his eyes, his hair, his beard, his mustache, they were like copper, molten copper. And uh, he had a trident in hand. When he yawned, it's almost that he was eating up the entire sky. Just by looking at him, people were so fearful, they started running here and there. So he was so huge that he was covering the entire three planetary systems with just his, uh, his size, his form. Now, because he was covering the entire planetary systems, he was covering, he was called Vritta, Vritra. Vritra is somebody who covers, uh, who covers the entire planetary system. So he was called Vritra, and he was obviously an, uh, created as an Asur. Although he was born in a Brahman family, he was essentially uh, created as an Asur. So his name was Vritra Asur, Vritra Asur. So as soon as he emerged with his trident in hand, with his huge form, he was creating fear as wherever he passed. And he came out of the sacrificial fire and headed straight for his job. And what was his job? To defeat and, and kill Indra. So he went and attacked the Devatas. So the Indras with all his, his Devatas, they came, they started fighting. They started throwing weapons at him, at Vritrasur. And when they threw the weapons, lo and behold, Ritrasur didn't have to fight back. He was so huge, so gigantic, that when the weapons were being thrown at him, he just swallowed them. As somebody swallows just a, a piece of sugar, candy sugar, he just swallowed these weapons. And the devatas were so, they were so fearful that the weapons, he's just swallowing the weapons. What would happen if actually they approach, they come, he comes closer to us, we'll all be killed. So they were so fearful, so fearful, they just started running here and there, hither and there. So again, Indra, he lost his, uh, his, his kingdom and Vritrasur took over. So again, when they lost their kingdom and uh, they were defeated completely by Vritrasur. They now decided what to do. You know, before they had gone to Brahma. Now they decided the best person to go to is the Supreme Lord himself. So they went to the Supreme Lord, prayed to him, and the Lord being pleased by their prayers appeared in their heart and then actually appeared before them, before their eyes. And as soon as the Lord appeared, as is always told to us, they glorified the Lord. So one of the lessons is as soon as we see the Lord, the form of the Lord, in the form of his Archa Vigraha, whether it's in the temple or home, as soon as we see the form, we should offer our obeisances and glorify the Lord. So they glorified him, you know, telling specifically telling him that he's a knower of all. He knows everything, Sarva Karana Karanam. And Essentially, they glorified the Lord by saying that the Lord appears in every millennium to annihilate the demons and to protect the devata, the devotees. So they prayed to the Lord that the Lord, please take an incarnation, please appear if you choose to do so, if you desire so, and please save us from this demon named Ritrasur, if you so desire. So usually in our prayers, uh, we normally say that, Krishna, can you please do this for us? Or can you do, can you please do this? And we add that important word, that important sentence, which is, if you so desire. So we are not here to impose our, uh, our requests on the Lord. We are here to place our request before the Lord and with the intent that if he desires, he shall fulfill but in any case, we are ready to take his, uh, his instructions and whatever he does, we deem that it is the best for us. 
here in, in Bhagavatam, it is said that the devatas essentially, they are what is described as sarkama devotees. Sarkam. Sarkam means they have material desires. Kam is desire and sarkam. So they are doing, they are praising the Lord with some material desire. And what is their desire in this case? They, they wanted to get some relief from an imminent danger of their own lives. So that's why they came to the Lord. So the, as soon as they put the request, and because the Lord was in front of them, they soon realized that actually the Lord is in front. He is you know, completely transcendental. And they had an opportunity to ask him something. They chose to ask him some small material benefit as misers. So they realized their, their you know, mistake and they felt that they were very apologetic and they, you know, they, they felt that they were, it wasn't right for them to just ask the Lord for protection. But anyway, they had done the deed. But still the Lord was extremely pleased by their prayers, by their glorification. And the Lord reconfirmed the fact that actually pure devotees, they don't ask for any material benefits, knowing them to be temporary. All they ask for is an opportunity to engage in devotional service, which is eternal. Nonetheless, they said that since you have approached me and you would like my help, I can tell you that you should approach another powerful Brahmana called Dadich, Dadich Muni. You approach him, he, as a result of his austerities, is extremely powerful. So you tell him to, you request him rather, that he gives up his body and request Vishwakarma to prepare a Vajra or a thunderbolt from his bones, which are extremely powerful. And once he prepares the thunderbolt, I will myself bestow my potency onto that th thunderbolt. And with that thunderbolt, you'll be able to kill Ritrasur. And by the way, don't worry. He is a demon, yes. But don't have to worry that he's going to cause you harm. Moreover, he's a devotee of the Lord. And let me tell you that he is not envious of anybody. So the Lord mentioned this point to Indra and the devatas over there. So at this point, devatas felt a bit assured that yes, there is a solution and all we have to do is to find the Dichimuni and get this thunderbolt made. But the big question is, they have to go and request somebody uh, and not somebody, he's a very you know, powerful Rishi, going and asking him to give, to die for them. You know, can you imagine we go to somebody, <laughs> especially somebody who's very powerful and uh, tell him that, can you please die for us? I would like to use your bones. And I mean, it's a very, you know, uh, very difficult request. At the same time, it was not about just a personal request. It was uh, something that, that was uh, affecting all the devatas. So in lieu of the group benefit, they took it upon themselves and they wanted to approach uh, the Dich Muni. So they, when, when they actually um, wanted, they were thinking, how do we actually approach him? So they thought it is best that we approach Dadich Muni through the Ashwini Kumars. Ashwini Kumar. So Ashwini Kumars, they had a history with Dadich Muni. Once this Ashwini Kumars, they had approached Dadich Muni and asked him to give them Brahma Gyan, knowledge, uh, transcendental knowledge. And Dadich Muni, as a result of his austerities, he had an invisible protective covering around him in the form of this Narayan Kavach. So that Narayan Kavach was given by Dadich Muni to Twashta. Twashta gave that Narayan Mantra to his son Vishwaru. And Vishwaru, in turn, as a result of that sacrifice and request of the Devtas, gave it to the Devtas. That's how they had access to the Narayan Kavach. So they thought that if we get Ashwini Kumaras to beg the Dichimuni to give up his body, uh, perhaps he would, you know, he should be able to give it. So uh, they they approached and uh, Ashwini Kumaras. Then Ashwini Kumaras, they had a history with the Dichimuni, as I mentioned. 
And the history was this, that when they approached Dadish Muni for um, getting, giving them knowledge, Dadish Muni initially said that, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, can you come back a bit later? And again, he was involved in that incident. How? Indra got to know that Ashwini Kumaras are coming to him for getting knowledge. And somehow or the other, he was a bit, you know, fearful. So he told Dadish Muni, well, they are ordinary surgeons, I mean, just, just physicians. They don't need this knowledge. Don't give it to him. And by the way, if you give it to him, I'll cut off your head. So when Ashwini Kumaras came back and uh, again approached Dadish Muni, Dadish Muni told him, this is what Indra has told me. So then they said that, okay, let's do like this. Let us cut off your head, give you the head of a horse. You give us the knowledge. Then when Indra comes, He'll cut off your head and then we'll put back your original head. Deal. So Tadish Muni said, well, you know, I've given you my word to give you this knowledge. So, so be it. So in, in view of this relationship Ashwini Kumar's had with Dadich, they were told to approach him. So the demigods, they approached Dadich Muni and uh, Dadich Muni was... Obviously, they put this request and he said, well, death actually is extremely unbearable to you know, whoever has goes through this, this process. So who would like to give up their body? And the devatas, they said that you're so kind and compassionate and it's for a bigger cause and you, you, you know that it's for the benefit of others. So after all that convincing, Radhich Muni said at the end of the day, the body. Some day or the other, it has to go. Rather, it goes for the benefit of others. Imagine you know, his magnanimity. Of course, he saw the will of the Lord and all this. And so he went into Samadhi, focused his mind on the Lord, and eventually gave up his material body. And from once he gave up his material body, Vishwakarma prepared this thunderbolt from his bones. And Lord Vishnu, infused it with his potency. Indra picked up this Thadmat gold and was confident that he's going to win this battle this time and went on towards uh, Prithrasur to fight his battle. So we will stop at this point in this series and next time we'll see what actually happened after the, and where did they meet for the battle? How did the battle progress? And there's a lot of uh, ups and downs in this battle. You know, it's like a proper, very nail biting finish of a rugby match or a cricket match where one team wins uh, or appears to be winning and then suddenly it reverses and then suddenly it reverses again and goes through so many ups and downs before the final finish. So, thank you very much. And we hope uh, we will uh, keep this, uh, this in the evening sessions and continue to enthuse each other and spread the glories of the Supreme Lord before we have nice days sleep. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai.